My name is Eva Piwet. I'm the director of the Jagiellonian University of the Third Age. I'm the co-organizer uh, co of this conference. I would like to welcome uh, you very warmly and invite the organizers who are going to uh, say a few words for our uh, to our participants. So I would like to um, invite the floor the uh, prorector of the Jagiellonian University for the Collegium Medicum, Professor. Doctor of Medicine uh, Tomasz Grodzicki. Um, I would like to invite to the floor uh, Mr. Guido de Mon, the, the General Secretary of the uh, European Union Citizens Union of Seniors. Please, the floor is yours. I would like to invite uh, Dr. Professor Bata Tobias Adamczyk. Um, I would like to invite uh, Ms. Wiesława Borczyk, the president of the All Poland Federation of University Associations of the Third Age, and Mr. Janusz Marszałek, the president of the Polish Senior Citizens Union. Uh, Rector, the floor is yours, please. Um, good morning, ladies and gentlemen. As Ms. Uh, please uh, put on your headset so you can uh, listen to uh, the translation. I can. Uh, to, to welcome all of you in the. I'll try to speak uh, then louder, but I think it's a matter of sound uh, or maybe some technical issues because I'm speaking quite. Quite loud, I believe. Or maybe this mic will be better. But I believe the speakers are the same. Doesn't matter. Okay. Uh, okay. So, ladies and gentlemen, I have a pleasure in, on, on behalf of the rector of the University, Professor Jacek Popiela, to invite you to welcome you very warmly in this uh, room. Thank you to the organizers that you chose Krakow as a place um, of our meeting and the University. Um, uh, you know, it is in the heart of the of Krakow. Actually, this is the building which is not so old as the university. Please uh, let me remind you that the university is like almost 650 years. This building is uh, younger. It's from the end of the 19th century, and um, it will for sure, we will have an anniversary soon. But still, it is a quite young building, I would say. And as you can see. This building is full of wonderful, beautiful paintings um, uh, painted by rectors from the previous years. So it's um, important to have a look at that uh, room and look at this original painting by Matejko and Kopernik. Uh, uh, the next year will be the um, Kopernik year, right? And you know that the Kopernik uh, also started in Krakow at the Aguilar University. So I believe that the room is uh, worth this meeting and you will um, have uh, really interesting um, discussions here, so I would like to wish you fruitful discussions and hopefully you find some time to visit Krakow, to go sightseeing, not only the university itself, but also Krakow. Um, so have a nice day. Thank you very much once again. Uh, dear Rector, um, dear ladies and gentlemen, dear guests and participants, of our today's conference uh, in this beautiful place at the Jagiellonian University in Krakow. I'm very pleased that uh, we can meet here uh, and all the representatives of 17 countries can meet here because we counted them from the European Union. And also, I believe that also the future uh, state as the history will show soon. Um, we also have organization from Belarus, right? So hopefully, uh, the Belarus and Ukraine will also uh, become uh, will have a will be in a different situation and will 
be able to they will be able to join the EU as well that's my wish and my feeling and I believe that it will happen soon as soon as possible well I also hope that today's that t today will be also um, a great moment for us to talk about this subject which uh, is going to be discussed today um, uh, I mean the European Union of Seniors um, uh, the Polish Federation of the universal associations of the third age and other organizations that are associated within this union together with Poland. Um, so, ladies and gentlemen, um, the history of this meeting is um, as follows. In January this year, after during the pandemic actually, we came to a conclusion, all of us, all the parties, um, uh, the European Union of Seniors, the President, uh, the associations of the third um, uh, age. Um, not all of us are here because uh, the lady had a, an accident, so she couldn't come here. The President had an accident. But but in all our discussions that we had, actually, in January, um, we came to a conclusion that the Union University will be the most beautiful place in Krakow in itself. So, that, so we are very happy that we can meet here. Um, 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 with the representatives of the European Senior Citizens Union, the Third Age University Associations, um, the Council um, of Seniors, and other organizations from Warsaw, from Krakow, from all over Poland and Europe, actually. So thank you again, and I would like to wish you a good day and fruitful discussions. So, dear guests, uh, ladies and uh, gentlemen, dear friends, also on behalf of the European Seniors Union, I would like to welcome you to this conference in Krakow, in this beautiful room of the university. We were glad that, uh, that we were invited by the university to, uh, to hold, uh, let's say, our, uh, our meeting in this uh, beautiful premises. But, uh, Today I'm replacing the president of the European Seniors Union, Professor Han Hermans, um, who is unable to be, to be with us today due to uh, medical reasons. She has experienced and followed the preparation for this conference very closely. And she definitely will be with us in mind today, I'm sure. Today, at this conference, several topics will be discussed all of which are of particular concern to seniors. It ranges from healthcare to lifelong learning. But a few hundred kilometers from here, a war has been raging on the European continent. Most seniors have never experienced war. All over Europe, but primarily in Ukraine's neighboring countries, we are experiencing the consequences of this futile war that benefiting no one. There is a huge influx of refugees from Ukraine to the European countries. There is an energy crisis and rising energy prices. And there is overwhelming misinformation. But it's mainly the elderly and the most vulnerable among them who will feel these consequences most immediately. We must certainly not lose sight of them. Dear friends, we have a very busy program today and we will discuss many topics concerning seniors. It's an educational and scientific conference and I'm sure that we will learn a lot today. We, will learn, we are a learning community today. I wish you all a very fruitful conference. Thank you.
Uh, good morning, ladies and gentlemen. I would like to welcome you very warmly in our university. On behalf of our pro-rector of the Jagiellonian University, uh, Professor Dr. Dorota Malec, who is uh, kind of like a positive soul, symbolic soul of this university. Um, of the third age, and it, because her all, whole activity has been supporting all actions that are uh, being made by this university. So, unfortunately, our rector could not come here today, but on my behalf, um, um, she would like to wish you all the best, uh, of course, wishing you fruitful discussions that will bring further inspirations, uh, further thinking of what we can do so that this university of third age can develop, right? And also so that this universities of third age can um, have a significant role and impact the whole society, especially senior society in all European countries. So, uh, Rector would like to wish you all the best, uh, fruitful discussions, and I'm just um, uh, conveying you uh, this information from uh, dear Rector. Thank you very much. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Um, on behalf of the All Poland Federation of Associations of Universities of the Third Age, I would like to welcome everyone very warmly and thank you very much for accepting our invitation. In the room, there are representatives which have been actually, who actually have been uh, mentioned by uh, other speakers from very Euro many European uh, countries, including experts, specialists in the field of uh, widely understood senior policy. And there are also representatives of uh, the administration of the government and uh, local governments, representatives of uh, NGOs, institutions uh, that um, act for seniors and act with seniors. And just to, referring to Professor um, Miss. Uh, the previous speaker regarding information about universities of the third age, I would like to say that the first university of the third age was established in Warsaw, in Poland, in 1975. And so, in three years' time, we are going to have a 50th anniversary of this wonderful undertaking which regards education, uh, which regards um, development um, activities, um, shaping um, skills, new competences um, among seniors, people who have uh, finished their professional life somehow, but they still want to be active, they want to be useful, they want to be engaged in the social activities, political activities within their environments, local communities, but also at the uh, regional level, um, national level and international level. So, ladies and gentlemen, I have this pleasure, this honor, because I have participated in teams that in Poland in 2012, uh, when the EU announced this year as a year of senior uh, people, we started working in our country on creating um, a senior policy. And so we created a first document, um, you know, of establishing of a senior policy for in Poland for 2014 and 2020. Many people who are here in this room um, from our NGOs um, acting for seniors from a scientific environment, a local government environment, institutions and uh, government institutions, well, they all participated in this works, and I have to say that that was an exceptional document, uh, which, um, which in this national dimension, but also European dimension, um, uh, showed the activities or the necessity, the need of activities, the need of planning these activities within senior policy in Poland, uh, relating also to some experiences of, uh, of Europe, uh, and also using data of the main statistical office and also European institutions when we show, you know, some indices of increase in seniors
większych ilości. We have a bigger and bigger number of seniors in our countries, right? The number is on the increase. So the policy of our governments and also the policy of the European Union should um, consider these activities. And I believe that this conference and the conclusions of this conference will also benefit that purpose. Thank you for your attention. Ladies and gentlemen, now we shall ask, perhaps we shall ask the, for the presentation according to the program you have received. You have received uh, conference um, papers, and in these papers you have uh, the program. In accordance with the program, in your blue file, we want to stick to our program. Now, the plan for now is the speech of Professor Stephen van Hecke. Do we have Professor here? Okay, so please kindly take the floor. The floor is yours. Janus and everyone else, Hido, uh, in the absence of Anne, it's always great to see familiar faces. Um, it's great to be back. And I'm also honored to be able to give you this morning to wake everyone finally up, hmm? even those who were not in the outside this morning, uh, with a keynote uh, sketching a bit the European political scene, as it has developed over the last couple of months, there already have been references to the war in Ukraine, but also what is currently at stake. Therefore, the title, Looking Ahead to European and Global Challenges. For me, it's also a pleasure to be here at this university, because Kai Leuven, together with this university and a couple of others, nine European universities, have formed a new alliance, Una Europa. If you might remember, uh, in his famous Sorbonne speech, the French President Emmanuel Macron announced a proposal to create European universities, meaning consortia of existing universities. There are several, and one of them is Una Europa. And for instance, Leuven, as well as Krakow and many others, will start next week with a common degree, a Bachelor in European Studies, making uh, this collaboration already in a particular uh, design. So I'm very happy to be able to be here. My university is a bit older than this one. We will celebrate 600 years in three years, but the main room is not as nice as this one. Uh, so I'm um, very pleased to be here in this fantastic room with indeed a very beautiful picture of Copernicus. We had Evisalus, which is also not bad after all, and Thomas More. In 1992, 1997, sorry, when I was still a student, I attended at my university the ceremony that granted then German Chancellor Helmut Kohl an honorary doctorate. I remember this very well because, of course, Kohl is already an impressive figure, given all, all, only his shape, but also what he said, I will always I remember, because for me, coming from Western Europe, his speech was quite a shock. This was a perspective that I did not hear before. I remember very well one sentence, a long time before I first visited Poland, it's my second time and it's great to be back here in Krakow. He gave this one famous sentence, which I always remembered. Huh? Literally, he said, Krakow and Prague are central European universities. So they are not even Eastern European. They are central European universities. They are in the middle of Europe, and they are also completely part of European history. I even used it huh, two years ago uh, for one of my columns huh, 
uh, a lesson in European uh, geography. It's also for me a bit special because it's only three weeks that I was in Poland. I passed Reshov, the airport, um, with a lot of American soldiers, the Patriots, you can see them there when you pass, on my way to Kiev. I was in Kiev three weeks ago. I also visited Bucha and Irpin, uh, which made a great impression on me as a political scientist commenting on um, the war in Ukraine and particularly the EU perspective, I wanted to see a certain number of things with my own eyes. So to have a different perspective on the same topic, a country that is now officially candidate to become member of the EU, and specifically its capital, uh, its institutions, its politicians, its activists, huh, during this particular period of time. Ten days ago, Ursula von der Leyen dressed, it was not the first time, I think it was the third or the fourth time I stopped counting, dressed in the colors of the flag of Ukraine, gave her so-called State of the Union. Previous presidents have done the same, like José Manuel Barroso and also Jean-Claude Juncker. At the beginning of the political year, in September, the President of the European Commission addresses the members of the European Parliament in Strasbourg. And this is also, I will use this speech to present what are the topics that the EU is currently discussing. Her speech was full of catchy phrases. I think she has a certain sense of uh, pathos, uh, of drama, which I think is good uh, to attract the attention. Totally different from Jean-Claude Juncker. Every politician has its own style. Of course, there are criticism about Ursula von der, von der Leyen. That is only natural. Huh? But I particularly like the way that she tries to catch the attention of the members of the European Parliament, of our attention, but also of a wider public. One of the sentences, sentences that she used was, this is a war on our energy, a war on our economy, a war on our values, and a war on our future. It's just a catchphrase, but at the same time, it perfectly summarizes the agenda of the EU. As Guido already said in his opening address, energy is on the top of the agenda in almost all the member states because of rising electricity and gas prices, inflation, etc. That puts a heavy pressure on the budgets of citizens and also of private companies as well as governments. So it's also a question of our economy. It's a question of values because it raises the issue, how much we want to sacrifice in order to stick together as a European Union, side by side to Ukraine. And therefore, I truly, be, I truly also believe huh, that the outcome of this war, this conflict, this conflict between two systems will be decisive for the future of the EU, how we will develop in the next decades what kind of position we will take in the wider world, what kind of image we will sell to the rest of the world, but also to our domestic audiences. The first part of the State of the Union of Ursula von der Leyen, Commission President 10 days ago in Strasbourg, can be summarized by the term strategic autonomy. Of course, she had several kind of issues. I'm not going to repeat everything. That's not my job. But the first part can be summarized under the umbrella of strategic autonomy. What does the EU want? The EU wants to be independent, autonomous, in critical areas. Next to technology and defense, also energy. We want to be self-reliant, not dependent on third actors that can blackmail us, like what is currently the case with the regime in Moscow, Vladimir Putin, using gas as a weapon to trying to divide the member states and also to weaken the European Union. The graph I choose to illustrate this first topic is the gas supplies that have dramatically changed 
during this year. While, of course, at the beginning of this year, we were largely dependent, not to say addicted, to cheap gas from Russia, this situation has completely changed. Not only because we diminished um, our demand for Russian gas, but of course also because Putin played a kind of a sinister game, huh? opening, closing gas pipelines, etc. Huh? Nord Stream 2 was never opened, Nord Stream 1 is actually closed. Huh? Uh, you see all this kind of uh, maneuvers still going on. Summarizing the graph, huh? instead of pipeline gas over Russia, huh? we, should, we see a huge increase in so-called LNG, uh, fluid gas, uh, overseas uh, from United States, from Australia, uh, and from other parts of the world. Also, Norway, of course, is increasingly uh, playing an, an, a very important role, uh, also earning a lot of money. They're also winners when there is a war. We should not uh, neglect it. Uh, we lose a lot because a lot of money is out of our economies, uh, uh, financing the suppliers of energy, but of course it ends up somewhere, not only luckily in autocratic regimes, but also in Norway. The European Commission is discussing these kind of uh, revenues, etc. The main thing is that in the short run, of course, we, would tr we have to face the situation that we need to get rid of this dependency on Russian gas and also oil while in the long term, of course, trying to get rid of fossil fuels anyway, huh? because we know it is a short-term solution, not a long-term, given also the climate change uh, challenge. The issue is to solve the crisis in the short run without undermining mid-term solutions. Next to, of course, the energy bills we need to pay supporting companies, supporting vulnerable families, etc. The Commission has set a lot of uh, proposals. Not much has this decided that, but of course there's also still a lot to decide and a lot to do by national and regional governments. The second part of the State of Union of Ursula von der Leyen can be summarized by the term conditionality. It, it refers to the main aim of this commission, to play a geopolitical role. What is geopolitics? It means that the market power you have, you're also willing to use it for political reasons. The period in which we trade it with everyone without conditions is over. This is not the way the EU wants to develop its new trade relations with the rest of the world. As you can see from the map, the map is from last year, with almost all over the world except Russia. Interesting, there is no free trade agreement with Russia, as you can see. With large parts of, of the world, the EU has trade agreements. What the EU is now currently doing, getting rid of the regime that we trade with everyone, we will trade on our conditions. After all, we are the largest market huh, after China and before the US, we have a lot of things to offer. A lot of companies from other parts of the world are interested in doing business with us. Fine, but it will be on our conditions. And conditions mean labor rights, human rights, environmental concerns, and also measures in terms of climate change. This is a game changer. We have been trading with the world for 30, 40 years, almost without conditions. Every new trade deal that is to be negotiated will be based on the use of conditions. And it's not a coincidence that the new trade deals are most easily done or finished with countries in the rest of the world that have more similarities with the EU, for instance, Canada and, and New Zealand, next to Vietnam. All the other ones, for instance, with the Mercosur countries of Latin America, are stuck. The European Parliament opposes it, and for good reasons, because not enough human rights, environmental, climate change, labor concerns are taken into account. This is, again, really trying to be a geopolitical player, not only having market power, but also using market power for a political agenda. The third part of Ursula von der Leyen's speech 
Her State of the Union can be summarized by trying to strengthen democracy. How credible can you be in the rest of the world if you want to trade, if you want to have relations on our own conditions? You can only be credible when your own model can also meet the standards of democracy, of human rights, of labor rights, of environmental concern, and of a fight against climate change. The EU is always, of course, on the first row to teach the rest of the world what they should do. Maybe that's not that bad after all, but it, of course, it's only credible huh, when you also do your homework. And a lot still needs to be done. The most obvious example is, of course, the regime of Viktor Orban, the day after the State of the Union, by Ursula von der Leyen in the European Parliament, the members of the European Parliament voted massively a resolution in which they first labeled the regime of Viktor Orban an autocratic or elect electoral autocracy, not a real democracy anymore. It's a Potemkin a democracy. It looks like a democracy, but it's not. Of course, a lot of concerns are still there among a number of other countries, Poland, but not only Poland, also Malta, uh, media concentration in Italy, uh, the, the, the Czech Republic, even my own countries, Belgium, there are a lot of things that still can be improved. I think it's a good sign, a good way that the European Commission is going to look at every member state uh, in a much more closely way than they did before. For Hungary, personally, I'm a bit pessimistic. Uh, after Viktor Orban has changed the constitution and the electoral system, it's almost impossible to beat him. The only thing that one can still do, and that is, this is currently the case, is I trying to isolate him. Thanks to the war in Ukraine, also the Polish have now realized on which side Viktor Orban eventually is. He is playing this kind of double ambiguous game trying to get everything out of the EU, in the first place money, but at the same time still making uh, deals with Vladimir Putin, which shows his true face. I've always said, and I can prove it since a, a, a long term, since a couple of years, Viktor Orban is an opportunistic politician. He has no ideology. The only thing that he fears is losing power. And therefore, he's an insult to true conservatives, true Christians, and true nationalists. That is my opinion. And the facts prove that I'm not that wrong after all. So if the commission wants to take this seriously, huh, new measures need to be taken. They need to stick huh, to the fact that Hungary, despite their own population, is not receiving any money yet from the next generation EU, so the Corona Fund, neither also in terms of the conditionality mechanism, also from other funds of the EU. If you want to be part of the club, then you have to stick to the rules, and then you cannot continue to play your party with basically Western European taxpayers' money. The party is over. The war in Ukraine has affected a lot of policy areas. This is the same slide as I showed in Tallinn at the regional conference a couple of months ago. It still makes sense to say that the start of the war in Ukraine is not only a milestone, but it's also a turning point. There is a before and there is an after. Of course, first of all, it's a war in a country, a neighboring country of the EU, Poland, and many others, as already had been said. But of course, the consequences are much larger. On security and defense, how, I, how are we going to organize it within the EU, and especially in relation to NATO? As already have been pointed out, how are we going to develop our foreign affairs, and especially our trade relations, with a real competitor, I don't think Russia is the competitor in the long term, it's the one in the short term, but the real competitor in the long term is, of course, China. Impact on energy policies and climate change, on migration, on enlargement, and enlargement was not a topical issue anymore, now it's on the top of the agenda again. 
with next to Ukraine, also Moldova being granted candidate status and Georgia, the so-called European perspective. There is a huge impact of the war in Ukraine on our budgetary and macroeconomic policy, on the role of the European Central Bank, trying to limit the rise of inflation. There is also a huge challenge in terms of cyber security. I always recall the Finnish example when, Vladim, when uh, Volodymyr Zelensky, the president of Ukraine, addressed the Finnish parliament. There was a cyber attack on a number of Finnish uh, government uh, websites. That's not a coincidence. So we do not need to be naive about that. Agriculture as well, the increasing food crisis. So Almost all policy areas have been affected by uh, the war in Ukraine and are currently debated within the EU. The issue is even larger than that, because the war in Ukraine is, of course, also a major issue for NATO, huh? and one of the major events that happened that could not be foreseen uh, until the start of the war is, of course, the membership of uh, Finland and Sweden, huh? about which we will hear in a couple of minutes. At the same time, I don't want to sound too pessimistic. I think the EU has proven in a number of occasions to be quite resilient, to be able to overcome crisis. Of course, in the beginning, there's a lot of debate because the member states disagree. That's true. That's the starting point. Do you really think that the member states agree on everything spontaneously? Of course not. The starting point is disagreement among the member states, next to the fact that the member states are unable to solve these problems, because most of them are transnational. The member states are unable, for instance, to solve the energy question on their own. And at the same time, they disagree. This is the starting point. The true challenge of the EU huh, is to try to come up with solutions. A central role has to be played by the European Commission to try to bring these member states closer together because there is no alternative but to agree on a number of things. Perhaps the outcome is not always very nice. It's not always very quick. For sure. Huh? What do you expect with 27 member states? Huh? But so far, I'm sorry to say, well, I'm not so sorry, there is no alternative but to bring the member states closer to each other because it's only together that they will be able to overcome all these challenges. Ursula von der Leyen, I'm almost finishing now, was not only in Kiev regularly, but she was also in Tezi. Most of you probably know, the brothers of uh, Frère et Roger and all the other ones are still there huh, in um, the south of France, huh, where a lot of people, especially young people, meet during the year, but also during the summer, to calm down, to reflect, to be in silence, to pray, etc. Ursula von der Leyen was there in August, and she referred to it in her speech. She recalled the enthusiasm, the European spirit, that she found in Tese, finishing with a very interesting proposal, I think also especially for this audience, and then I quote, we believe that it's time to enshrine solidarity between generations, intergenerational solidarity, which has been a topic always of high value for the European Seniors Union in our treaties meaning that generational solidarity should be one of the founding principles of the EU. So far, no misunderstanding, it's a proposal that Ursula von der Leyen put on the table, but she thought it's worth mentioning in her State of the Union, and she also proposed to enshrine it in the treaties as one of the basic principles of the EU intergenerational solidarity. Before continuing this conference, I would like to invite you, invite Margareta Palson to take the floor, because uh, it's not even on the program, so you have some extras for free. Margareta Palson is an experienced politician from Sweden. She's a former member of the Riksdag, the Swedish parliament, and now representing also the seniors of Moderata. She will, in her personal capacity and also as a representative of one of the two member states, 
uh, continue uh, our understanding, trying to understand what has been going on. Uh, very fascinating given the history of both Finland and Sweden becoming, um, almost becoming members of NATO. Margareta, you have the floor. Ladies and gentlemen, dear friends, first I will tell you something about the election in Sweden. Uh, the Swedish election was on September the 11th, 9-11. <laughs> it resulted in a parliamentary majority for center-right and right-wing parties. After leaving government in 2014, the moderate party and the rest of the center-right parties have struggled on how to deal with the rise of the populist Sweden Democrats, whether to isolate or engage with them. During the past four years in opposition, the moderate party has solidified its role with the new political landscape as the main party able to assemble and form majorities for center-right policies and to be able to have a working relationships with all parties in the parliament. Our goal now is form a government with center-right parties that will be able to negotiate with the Sweden Democrats in Parliament. Our policies align on the most important issues on the agenda where we see a need for major reforms, such as strengthening law enforcement, and investing in our energy systems, including building new nuclear power. In many ways, Sweden politics during the upcoming years will likely be more comparable with the political developments in other Nordic countries where the center-right parties have found ways to work with the new populist parties in their parliaments. And our engagement for European cooperation and translatic security will remain strong, following in the footstep of previous center-right governments in Sweden. And now to NATO. Sweden and Finland applied for NATO membership in May this year, following the new and deteriorated security landscape in Europe over Russia's full-scale invasion in Ukraine. The question of joining NATO was immediately raised in both countries as the war broke, broke out on February 24, putting an end to decades of military non-alignment. This important shift in Swedish and Finnish policy in response to the war will now contribute to European long-term security as we improve our deterrence in the Baltic Sea region a common defense planning will increase stability and remove possible uncertainties regarding our collective action in the region. For Sweden, the application for NATO membership follows a path towards increased engagement meant in a transatlantic cooperation after decades of military non-alignment. As a strong advocate for a Swedish membership in the alliance, the moderate party has played an important role 
prayo to as well as throw out the process. This spring, a broad consensus was reached reach in Parliament in support of membership. Historical similarities can be found with the Swedish application for EU membership three decades ago. Just like the current process, the modern party was a driving force in the campaign for Swedish membership and the moderate government under Prime Minister Carl Bildt, negotiated and laid out the groundwork for Swedish entry in the European communities in the beginning of the 1990s. This time, it will be up to the new moderate government under Ulf Kristersson to define Swedish new role as a NATO ally. First off, the new government enters office this fall as the process to rat ratify the occasion protocols goes on. Throughout the membership process, the now, the now outgoing Prime Minister Magdalena Andersson and the moderate parties Ulf Kristersson has both signalled the importance of unity on this on the issue. After the election victory, one of the first major announcements by Ulf Kristersson was that the next government will keep the current state secretary responsible for the NATO negotiation in office throughout the membership process. This will provide continuity in the remaining talks. The second and more long-term question will be about Sweden's new role as a NATO ally and what our country can bring to the table in their alliance. The moderate party has throughout the decades emphasized the importance of a strong cooperation between the Nordic and Baltic countries also referred to as the NB8. Now, with all countries in the same military alliance, new opportunities for cooperation should arise to further strengthen the bonds between the neighboring states. Strengthening NATO in both the Arctic and in the Baltic Sea region would be a long-term strategic importance for European security. This can also include Swedish participation as a security provider in the region, for example, by talk, taking part in NATO air policy over the Baltic states. It is also clear that smaller countries in NATO can punch above their weight, for example, by being an active participant in NATO missions or because of their cap capabilities. With an advanced defense industry and as a global leader in telecommunication, different word, Swedish membership in NATO should be of benefit both for regional stability and for the alliance as a whole. From the Arctic to the Black Sea, we are all affected by Russia's war against, against Ukraine and all its hostilities along the eastern flank. The number one priority in this year ahead will be to continue our support for Ukraine and for the European security order. This will include both military aid and support for Ukraine's reconstruction and European integration as we aim for the vision of a Europe 
of a Europe whole, free, and at peace. Thank you. And General Professor Van Hecke introduced the situation in Europe and global situation in terms of changes that are ahead of us, how we look in terms of a war situation in the world context between Russia and Ukraine. Ms. Parson concentrated more on Sweden and how um, joining NATO on the part of Sweden, um, and how important it is in the sphere of Baltic uh, area and how it can help in perhaps combating uh, this regime uh, with Putin regime. So thank you very much for your speeches. And now we have several minutes. Um, we have a quite, actually, we are really sick to the time. So if you have any questions, like two or three questions to um, Professor Han Hecke, we can actually uh, we could actually ask them, um, so professor may uh, may comment on them or answer to your questions if there are any. Of course, would you like would you like to to ask any questions to professor Van Hecke? At this point, I cannot see any hands raised. Maybe later. So um, I would like now to ask Miss Borczyk to introduce um, to read a letter from the minister. Oh no, there is a question. There's a question. The speaker and the interpreter cannot hear the question. Nicht zu Ihrem Vortrag. Ich weiß nicht, ob ich Sie fragen darf, wie die Referenten gestern ausgegangen sind. Natürlich positiv, 98x Prozent. Aber die Kommentare, die dazu abgegeben werden, sowohl in der Ukraine als auch in den anderen Ländern, darf ich das fragen? Es gehört hier nicht. Thank you. Yes, it's a question about. Yes, of course, that's what I wanted to say. So the question is about, about the recent events in Russia, uh, the announcement of uh, the speech of Vladimir Putin, the partial mobilization, the referenda that have been taking place in the occupied areas. What does it mean? With a bit of distance, it's not a surprise that a lot of things are happening now. The summer was relatively calm. The winter will be relatively calm too because of the weather conditions. So literally, the situation will be frozen during the winter in military terms. You cannot do much. So from November until February, not much will happen. On the ground, of course, there can be missiles, there can be a number of incidents uh, with the nuclear plants, etc. There will be news every day. Uh, but in strictly military terms, not much can happen. Uh, you cannot, in these winter conditions, uh, conquer or reconquer territory. Both parties are trying to improve their position on the ground. Uh, that is why the Ukrainians start this offensive. Uh, and for the first time, uh, since three weeks, they are in an offensive position. So far, they have always been in a defensive position, trying to protect their territory. Now they are reconquering. This, of course, triggers an answer by Russia. They have to withdraw troops. They have, we have seen a lot of problems. So in that way, the Russian response has to be understood. I think the speech of Vladimir Putin served different audiences. The domestic audience in the first place. Of course, we look at it as if the speech is given to us, but this is not necessarily the case. I think the speech of Vladimir Putin was in the first place for a domestic audience, and particularly the pro-Russian audience in Ukraine, giving, sending them a message, we will not let you down despite all the difficulties we have now on the ground. That's the first target audience. We will not let, let you down. The second audience is the domestic Russian audience. 
we have everything under control, but we need to speed up because this is a conflict not between Ukraine and Russia. This is a conflict between NATO and the West. They are trying to get rid of us, so we need to improve, we need to increase our stakes. Of course, this is completely surrealistic because as Putin always does, he turns the positions uh, upside down. He likes to sell this war as the West is invading Russia, while clearly the opposite is the case. The third audience are we, the EU and the, and the, and the West, especially the very last center, sentence, this is serious. The Dutch word, I don't know the English words, bluff poker, this is real serious. I'm not pretending, while we all know he is pretending. There are a lot of con uh, contradictions inside his message. I think, generally speaking, his response was a sign of weakness. If you are very strong on the ground, you don't need this partial mobilization. You don't need laws that punish your own soldiers when they don't want to go fighting. And I go on for a number of reasons. Even when you now do not want to go to the military, just to give you one example to show how surrealistic this is, if you, don't go, if you have to go to war as a Russian soldier and you are not going to war, then you end up in a jail. How can you leave jail by going to fight in Ukraine? So this is a kind of a strange circle, right? So a number of issues. Um, are a bit strange. I think the main concern for the West now is to stick to our position. Also in my country, a lot of commentators already said, yeah, we need to take into account the sensitive sensitivities of the Russians, so the nuclear um, threat has to be taken very serious. Of course, we always need to watch what is going on in Russia, but I think generally that the position recently taken by Vladimir Putin is a sign of weakness, so we need to stick to our position. We need to continue now, more than ever, continue to support Ukraine in many different ways, especially before the winter. We need to stick to our sanction regime, as Ursula von der Leyen said in her State of the Union. They are currently preparing the aid package of as sanctions. We need to continue to isolate within the EU Viktor Orban, because he's the only ally left within the EU, basically, as far as Russia is concerned. We will see what the positions in Italy will end up after Sunday. We have elections there. There are a lot of concerns. But at least as far as Ukraine is concerned, I'm not so worried huh? because Giorgia Meloni, huh, probably the next prime minister of Italy, huh, has been very outspoken on Ukraine. So pro-Ukraine and contra-Russian, uh, not as Silvio Berlusconi and not as uh, Matteo Salvini. So as far as Italy is concerned, I'm not so worried. This is really the time for the EU to show strength, to show a resilience to show that we stick to our position. Because also, when we change our attitude, Vladimir Putin will interpret this as a, as a sign of weakness. This is something we cannot allow. The game of blackmailing has been going on too long. I think now, by far, everyone has learned it lesson. We don't want to go back to the situation before the war, so we really need to stick to our position especially as long as Ukraine wants and asks us to do. It's not we that started the war. It's not we that uh, started to help Ukraine. It was always on the demand of Ukraine. As long as Ukra U Ukraine demands us to help, we should be able to uh, do it. a question to Mrs. Parsons, if it's possible. Sure. Shall I, shall I ask, or should she come forward? I, I don't know. Anyway, okay. The, the question to Mrs. Parsons, she didn't go into it. At, uh, to become member of NATO, uh, the parliaments of all members have to ratify. At the moment, three countries are remaining. They have not ratified yet. As far as I remember, it's Slovakia and Malta not, but they are in the process of doing it. 
But the one who has not done it and might not done, do it for the time being is Turkey. And Turkey makes, according to me, a lot of, well, to me, unacceptable conditions for membership of Sweden and, and Finland, but mostly Sweden, um, because they want Sweden to go after ethnic Turkish people living in Sweden, especially Kurdish people, but also Gulen people, and so on, and on grounds which actually for us are unacceptable, because the, what, he, what he is blaming Sweden for, in Netherlands they have the same. We have the same rights for these people as they have in Sweden. Fortunately, um, Turkey cannot tell that Netherlands has to be expelled or from it. But, but even so, uh, what does the new moderate government under Ulf, um, uh, what's his name, anyway, the new Swedish government, how will they react uh, to this? Because this is, of course, a very sensitive issue. How do, how do you think you can solve this problem? Adalina, will you come to the floor? Thanks for the question. Of course, it's the biggest problem we have with NATO nowadays. But we think it will be a solution on this too. Now, Ang Hangar Hungary, Hungary has said we will say yes, and that is, as you say, then remains Turkey. But we think Turkey will say yes too, because if they don't, they will get many enemies and they have not, nothing to win. But they, want to, they want to point out that they can, um, can be uh, the bad boy in the class, but uh, soon I am sure they will say yes, and we don't have those problems with Turkey as uh, the social, socialist, social democrats government had. So it's easier for us. Thank you, Madalena. Just a small uh, comment and then we are finishing. I think indeed uh, the positions are changing. They are not the same as a couple of months ago. Hmm? Vladimir Putin has less support now of China. Huh? India is not happy with the war. Huh? Also, Turkey is changing its position. Huh? They said that Ukraine has the right huh, to get its territories back. Huh? So it's now a bit more on the side of Ukraine and less on Russia. When everyone else is becoming more critical vis-a-vis -vis Russia, then the EU has more reason than ever to stick to its opposition and to stay firm to the Ukrainian case, to continue the line that has been set since the 21st of February. And let's stick together. I think this is the main message that I want to give and also in support of the people of Ukraine to keep this European Union together. That is the main challenge, I think, for the coming weeks and months. Thank you very much. Professor Van Hecke, thank you very much. Proszę Państwa. And gentlemen. And now um, we are going to have a short, um, nice um, act because we have the, the chairman of the Krakow Union and he would like to um, give a small gift to Mr. Dimon um, on the occasion of this meeting, today's meeting. Yes, uh, between the, your uh, presentation and the other presentation which is going to be made, she received a reward uh, because she's working uh, for the benefit of senior policy. So we would like, on behalf of the senior from Krakow, to give you a symbol that combined different societies in Europe. Uh, here we have Lyconic, Krakow Lyconic, like horse, it's a special gift for you. It's a, it's a Krakow gift, a uh, symbol, Krakow symbol. This is for you.
Thank you very much. Ladies and gentlemen, and dear participants, I can say as follows. After this introductory general speeches, very interesting ones, um, uh, because they present the situation um, in many contexts, an international situation in Europe, it will be easier for us, perhaps, to talk We'll be, um, we'll be able to talk about it um, and look at the subject in a broader scope. I mean, what is the subject? Uh, seniors of contemporary Europe, issues and challenges. At the same time, before we uh, proceed to the panel discussions, I would like to, on behalf of the Vice Minister of Family and Social Policy, um, Mr. Stanislav Sved, who is very sorry he cannot be here today with us, but he sent us a letter with a request to read it to you. So please let me um, read it to you. So the letter is addressed um, to Bisarova Vorczyk, the president of the All Poland Federation um, of Third Age Universities, because on behalf of the organizers, I address this invitation to Mr. Minister, to the minister, and this uh, answer is addressed to me as well. So, ladies and gentlemen, uh, the participants of the uh, Krakow Conference, I would like to say a huge thank you for inviting me in the international conference which is both educational and scientific under the title Senior Citizens in Contemporary Europe Issues and Challenges, which is organized uh, on the 24th September 2022 in Krakow. I'm very sorry, but because of the previously planned obligations, I will not be able to participate in this important event. At the same time, I would like to say thank you to the president and co-organizers of the European um, Senior Citizens um, Union, the Polish Senior Union, and the National Federation of Associations of Universities of the Third Age for your engagement and work in the continuous development of uh, senior policy. I am convinced that this conference uh, organized with such a competent leaders, um, uh, national, international leaders, organizations, senior organizations, universities of the third age and representatives of higher education universities uh, and public administration and experts will contribute to shaping new directions of actions in the scope of social policy. Um, or this event organized by yourself will also be another opportunity for strengthening of a dialogue and um, exchange of views, strengthening solidarity between generations and collaboration between uh, nations and also strengthening the relationships between um, the senior organizations. Um, the demographic changes that are going on, the prolonging pandemic um, and um, fearful situation, international situation that we are dealing with made seniors require from us special support and care. And that is why I am very happy that we are planning this cycle of discussion panels regarding the use of modern technologies in the scope of care over seniors, activities supporting um, uh, their um, proper mental condition, body, and challenges that are ahead of these European societies in the coming years. I also believe that all these discussions and exchange of views and opinions will make us closer to ensure safe and diligent um, 
conditions of life among seniors in their local communities, but also creating better future for next generations. Once again, thank you very much for inviting me and to all participants and organizers of today's event, let me uh, con uh, say, uh, let me congratulate on uh, their, all your successes and I wish you further success in the realization of your activities directed towards seniors. With all respect, Stanislav Schwedt, the Vice Minister of Family and Social Policy. Ladies and gentlemen, before we go to the first panel, I would also like to thank for thank you for the honorary patronage over our conference to the university director, the Yale University Rector, and also to the ombudsman, um, civil right ombudsman, the media patronage. Um, involves the Krakow radio. So thank you so much to the Radio Krakow and also to our interpreters. As you can see, we have uh, booths uh, in the room. Uh, so we have also interpretation available, which is in Polish, English, German, and Spanish. I think this will additionally make it easier for us to, to talk to one another and, you know, it enable us to be active in this conference. And now I would like to invite to the floor, to the chairs, the following guests and panelists because they are going to take part in this discussion panel entitled Problems of Healthcare System and Care Over Seniors, uh, a situation in the EU uh, states during the COVID-19 pandemic. As a moderator, I would like to ask Dr. Anna okońska Valkovich. she's the plenipotentiary of the mayor of the Krakow city for the senior policy. And as panelists, I would like to invite Georg Manik, the vice president of the European Senior Citizens Union, the chairperson of the associations of seniors in Isama, the founder of the Social Security Council and Social Insurance System in Estonia. Also, um, we will have other panelists, Dr. Barbara Professor, um, uh, Doctor of Medicine Barbara Griglewska, she's a professor of the Medical University and my medical director in the um, postgraduate uh, center, uh, Collegium Medicum of the Yale University. Professor Beata Tobias Adamczyk, she represents the Yale University Collegium Medicum as well, and Janusz Marszałek, um, the president of the uh, management board of the European Senior Citizens Union and the chairman of the Polish Senior Citizens Union. So I would like to ask you to come to the floor and let's start our panel, the health care system problems and care over seniors. I hope that this panel will be an interesting one for all of you. Take your seats, please. Yeah, here we have another microphone if you need one. Or you can, I believe, come to here and actually maybe it will be easier for you to moderate this discussion. So the choice is yours how you prefer to do that. Ladies and gentlemen, I have an honor to moderate this uh, first discussion panel during which we will listen to uh, experts. But please allow me, as the local um, clerk, let me uh, um, welcome you on behalf of Mr. Majkowski, who um, who because of his age, but also because of his managing capacities. He's a very—he's really interested in senior policy. So, um, 
I would also like to say a few words about this wonderful place. Um, I think this genius Lotzi will influence um, the value of this meeting. Please let me um, tell you that you know, you know that our university is uh, 650 years old. Let me introduce um, uh, figures: uh, King Kazimierz Wielki, Kazimierz the Great, who is the founder actually of the university. Um, that in a Wawel Castle hosted first professors, first scientists. And then we had the king of Poland, Jadwiga, in the middle, above, who um, left a huge heritage, her jewelry and goods for the benefit of the Jagiellonian University, and her husband, uh, King ja uh, Władysław Jagiełło, who, was, who actually um, made that happen. And these are the first promoters of the first years of this university. I'm talking about uh, the first half of of the second half of the 14th century when it comes to the creation of this university but these are also um, people from the 14th century right so this place allows us when looking at these figures um, to even uh, better integrate around this important scientific thought and we can do that because among us we can see wonderful guests representatives of science um, who um, analyze the problems, the issues of health, um, seniors, you know, because you know the matter of health is one of the issues, I mean the deterioration of health is a kind of feature of uh, being older, right? Of course within the senior policy we concentrate not only on not only on health, but also we want to take care, we think uh, we want this aging to be healthy. Because Krakow is a city that declared care for, um, um, you know, successful aging. But of course there are some processes that we cannot avoid and aging is one of them, but we want to, we want it to happen in a, let's say, um, dignity, right? So let's start, maybe I would, I'd like to ask Mr. Gorg Manik, um, the Vice President of the European Senior Citizens Union, who is going to talk a little bit about the insurance system in Estonia and about health problems in this country. So the floor is yours, please. Uh, very shortly about the Estonian uh, social security system. We have public social security. You can't hear? Let's try again. Translation. It works? Okay. Yeah. Uh, in Estonia, we have quite classical public health insurance system. It means that uh, uh, most of our uh, people in Estonia are secured. And it means that if we need uh, health uh, services, then it will be covered by sick fund. Resources sick fund is collected uh, as like payroll taxes, 13 persons from payroll. It means that every, uh, every employee and employers also at the same time should pay these resources. It's very hard to say this is enough for healthcare services or not because our average salaries, uh, salaries uh, they are a little bit lower than let's say average in Europe. It means as like absolute figures uh, in money terms we have very small lack of resources but I have to say up to today, we survived quite well. About future, I am not sure. Might be we should a little bit revise our health insurance system. But uh, I think that uh, might be we will go to closer to today's issue uh, about uh, pandemic. And might be for introduction, I can just give uh, short information uh, from our point of view, I mean senior's point of view. Uh, and uh, we discovered quite soon, and probably all of your countries also discovered that actually most vulnerable group of society, it's senior members of society. Might be you all mentioned it. But we defined uh, three big uh, groups of problems. 
First point, I don't know how about in your countries, but I can say that we had lack of adequate and clear information. And bad side, it was that quite often journalists they say, generated own information also additionally to medical information. It means so that people who are, might be uh, weren't uh, so clever to use uh, IT and, and mass media instruments, they were quite often very heavily puzzled. And it means they didn't know how to behave. The best uh, example, of course, might be also mentioned in your countries, for example, about how to uh, assess uh, and necessity vaccination. It's, it's crazy up to today. We have already in the pandemia experiences two and more years, but still, I don't want to say very, very strongly, but mighty 40 percent of senior members are not vaccinated properly. Mm -hmm. This is very uh, important point. Second point is actually we have to go back to philosophy, how to. Um, how to create uh, or reorganize health care system in country. Up to today, this uh, 30 years independence, we survived. Quite okay. We have uh, developed uh, inpatient, outpatient health care system. But now, in this uh, pandemic time, we discovered that we weren't too ready for crisis, we did manage so well as we expected. And second point is might be even more, uh, let's say, bad and not okay at all. Lot of people who needed planned treatment, whatever diagnosis, say didn't have this treatment because under isolation, hospitals. Isolations, uh, medical services, it means that people should stay home, eat with serious diseases. And actually, one side I can tell that, okay, we managed, but another side, thousands and thousands of people, especially senior members, they uh, didn't have treatment at the right time. This is a very big uh, issue for the next uh, steps in our country. Third, might be this is for this auditory is uh, uh, might be interesting word as like cooperation. Two kind of cooperation, cooperation inside in country. It means that uh, different uh, ministries, different departments, different levels of administration. We did discover that sometimes misunderstanding was quite heavy in inside society. And let's look now border way, it's the same word communication, cooperation between countries. It wasn't so easy how to manage with uh, trans transnationalities, uh, business between Estonia, between Finland, between Sweden. Especially, we had very big, I am sorry to say, we had uh, the first month is very big problem with people who did work in Poland or Germany because Poland closed the borders so heavily, so strictly that we had very big headache uh, with this one. So, in this case, I can understand that these are, might be most of important issues about we should discuss. Of course, we are not able to give 100% answers, but at least we can take these ideas with us and develop further at home. And we will see, because we have to say, we should declare very clearly, that this pandemic is not first, not last, and actually in world, much more serious pandemics might be occur us. So I think that we can uh, discuss some minutes about these issues and if we can take something clever ideas home, probably we are all thankful on this one. <laughs> Thanks at first, it's your first <laughs> question. Thank you very much. Um, 
you uh, for for um, telling us uh, about the problems that uh, senior in your country are dealing with uh, in Estonia. So now I would like to ask um, the other uh, panelists, my professor, uh, please, if you could take the floor, um, Professor. Barbara Griglewska, who is the professor of the Egan University, she's a geriatric specialist and she's going to present some problems related to uh, long-term uh, hospitalization, which is an important problem related to especially um, seniors. So the floor is yours. Thank you very much. Let me maybe stand over here. Since I'm a doctor, um, I thought that for you it would be more interesting, uh, rather than presenting information how the situation looked during the pandemic, and uh, yeah, there was a huge risk for seniors at that point, but I believe in all the European countries they had the same problem and it was observed. So I would like to talk about a certain approach whether hospital is the best place, the most friendly place for a senior, actually. So traditionally, um, of course, um, you mentioned that we need more beds because uh, our society uh, is aging and the seniors are the ones that most often use uh, health care. Um, but in a traditional approach, we all look at a hospital like a place where, thanks to interventions, thanks to our activities, medical activities, different procedures, we uh, have a um, chance to make our health, make our body, let's say health, these are the quality of our life is, is, is good, right? So we can function in a society till the end of our life. But unfortunately, um, as you can see, uh, we are not close to this optimal place thanks to these doctors' interventions, hospital interventions. We are not close, ideally close to this uh, curve, optimal curve uh, in this optimal aging, you know. Um, so why does it happen? It's because the hospital has a lot of threats for seniors because the process of aging is a physiological process. We all are experiencing uh, aging, right? What we can see on the outside is a sort of a signal that something is going on, but uh, all the organs are affected by this process. What happens in the body um, um, somehow um, uh, can happen also in hospitals. This is a very old slide from oh, several dozens of years which shows uh, what happens now in muscles in the circulation system, in bones. Uh, we have uh, a lower level of water, a lower um, efficiency of our nervous system and all this happens in, also um, in hospitals. So when senior comes to the hospital, uh, a good example is that Let's say there's a senior who has a deterioration in their health. Let's say, for example, pulmonary disease. He, he goes to bed. He can't get up out of bed. So he's kind of dependent on the environment, right, in terms of meals, fluids, and so on and so forth. And they cannot move, which leads to lower muscle density. And then uh, the volume of water, they, he, they become dehydrated. So if the personnel doesn't note that, note that then he may become dehydrated, malnourished. His Muscle may uh, disappear. He may fall down. Um, there might be also some deterioration in or acute brain um, um, disease. So then there might be a condition which is uh, sort of uh, he can't uh, think properly. And of course, we have to control this this condition. Um, uh, to prevent further changes. So we uh, administer some medications that can generate some um, side effects and as a consequence the person comes healthy to the hospital but they are discharged um, unmobile and they are become dependent on the society. Oftentimes also they have to be admitted to some kind of like social care center. So when we look at this patient we try to look at different directions to combat all these risks that the patient can um, deal with with. But in general, uh, we have very few geriatric hospitals. Of course, it, this number may be different in different countries, but within um, a few, several dozens of years, although our awareness has increased, and we, we are talking about this, that you know we have universities that also provide classes on aging, 
but nothing not much has changed here you can see this data i didn't want to talk too much about data but all this shows I'm showing you one study uh, which says, uh, which talks about the risks of different complications in hospital conditions. And here you can see that there is deterioration in physical function, which is three times higher among people um, after 70 years of age. And um, in con urine inconsistency twice as much. Um, we have also here delirium uh, symptoms. And the person who has who struggles with certain um, everyday activities, then we have you can see fifty percent increase, an increase in falls as well. If an elderly people stays in uh, person stays in bed, then they may have ulcers. If uh, there's any um, complication, it's like twice as much of these risks. So the knowledge has increased, but in terms of hospitals, well, the risk is still there. It's really really high. Um, and these negative factors, there's a lot of negative factors that influence the deterioration of the functionality of such a patient. So what can we do uh, to diminish this hazard, this risk? Well, for sure, a lot of work on the uh, hospital procedure. Um, well, we can introduce different kinds of regulations in hospitals, but the most important thing that I would like to tell you about is to avoid planned or diagnostic hospitalizations here because of course it seems that uh, the patient is admitted to the hospital and they they will receive everything that we can offer to them uh, which i mean all the diagnostic procedures tests will be provided as soon as possible unfortunately what i showed you it doesn't change the patient is admitted and do he will or she will undergo different diagnostic procedures um, not in appeal because he will be in this negative environment remember there's an environment around so uh, from the point of view of a doctor from a medical point of view it's better to change to develop an outpatient diagnostic procedures because we don't want the patient to wait months for tests we don't want them to be admitted to, to this negative environment we want to organize that um, as sort of a, like in an oncological patients who needs to have a quick diagnostic path because we have to diagnose it very quickly because we have to treat them very quickly um, maybe the same path uh, the same with seniors right we here we should introduce a quick path of diagnostics so that these patients don't have to um, wait so long uh, and be hospitalized right for that period of time another problem is um, uh, changing organization in hospitals to increase safety of elderly patients here we can use different model technologies sensors that we can uh, apply observations monitoring maybe cameras all these modern technologies are really helpful for sure and another element that would um, help and should be there uh, is minimizing therapeutic immobilization so everything uh, when the patient is made to hospital we do that for the safety right of these patients they are on a wheelchair they don't walk they sit on the wheelchair because we don't want them to fall down right to get injured because the hospital is responsible for that injury so another thing ladders um patient should not be mobile should be in bed which of course immobilizes such patient and their physical functionality is limited so we should minimize, eliminate such barriers like ladders. Also, we should think about eliminating um, noise. Remember, hospitals are loud and the patient cannot uh, sleep. And sleep deprivation is also, that also affect negatively their health, mental health, cognitive um, health, and then procedures like drips, uh, catheters. Well, a young patient can deal with that, that they have a drip or a catheter, they can walk, they can go out to the corridor, they can walk, but the senior will not be able to, to do that. So again, he will be immobilized in bed. And another hazard, contact with drugs, medications, probably for you it's obvious that medication is the only good thing, but it is also connected with the negative complications, side effects. Um, so monitoring uh, and limiting the number of drugs, medications is also very important, which should be introduced in hospitals, in each hospital. Um, it's also limited costs, right? And the last point, which I think geriatric doctors prom are promoting, uh, is planning discharge from the hospital. 
when they are admitted. So the patient is admitted. We plan their treatment somehow, how long he's going to be there. We discuss with the patient, with the family, so that we have this perspective, what's next after he's discharged. Um, so it will also allow us to um, organize this care in, at home. Another group um, of these elements minimizing, diminishing this hazard in hospitals um, are people, personnel. That's another aspect. And here it will be a good idea to have seniors, especially those who are not mobile with many diseases, that they are admitted to geriatric departments, wards. But in Poland, well, we have 40-something geriatric departments, wards, and it's not possible for such elderly patients uh, can be admitted there uh, because you have too many such patients. So they are hospitals in different departments, not only geriatric. As a consequence, they are are treated by different doctors of different specialties and you know education among doctors is different various um, the level is different of course it will be good uh, for geriatric consultations uh, to be conducted uh, among them so that they can be evaluated we, we know then the limitations and so on and so forth but it doesn't uh, happen often because in Poland, we don't have such a big number of uh, geriatric doctors, although we have a big country, we have quite a lot of uh, seniors in Poland, over 20% of population, but we are lack, we lack such doctors, geriatric doctors, and there's not many doctors who would understand this age and the disease of this age, only like 1,500 doctors for the whole Poland. So it will not be possible. So what I mean is we have to improve education among medical personnel from nurses through um, other uh, staff, other specialties, so that we can increase the awareness among these doctors what happens with such a senior at different departments. And it is also important to note uh, you know, an increase um, in geriatric education among nurses. There's, I believe, geriatric specialization specialty in nursing. Unfortunately, in Poland, it is not very popular because the majority um, nursing, long-term nursing was more popular. It is dedicated to healthcare, uh, let's say, um, healthcare centers, long-term centers. But with in terms of geriatric health, when we think about prevention, promotion of health and uh, prevention of different diseases also at home is not so much popular, unfortunately. The specialty uh, is not developing so, so much. From the point of view of hospital departments, we also need, we would need uh, people like, for example, um, nutritionists or people who would support uh, such people in terms of their food and, you know, um, in terms of feeding, because oftentimes they are not able to feed themselves. And if we have malnourishment, then treating the disease uh, gets worse, you know, it's more difficult then. So uh, nourishment is also very important. So we need dietitian, nutritionist, but also physiotherapists to rehabilitate such patients, to mobilize these patients. It's a huge problem at different departments. Um, for example, the one I worked in, where we have a few thousands of patients, we have two physiotherapists. So to that of patients, are if they lie in bed, how much time can such a physiotherapist devote to one patient. So we lack physiotherapists. We have a huge need in physiotherapists. We need to increase the number of physiotherapists um, to rehabilitate such such um, patients, um, you know, in ordinary departments, wards. It would also be good uh, uh, to have uh, medical personnel, uh, a bigger number, so we have to support these patients, remember, to motivate these patients, to walk this patient to the bathroom, to the restroom. So maybe we should also uh, get some caregivers, maybe some volunteers who are going to support medical personnel in, in taking care of these patients. It is also important to have this interdisciplinary approach, collaboration, interdisciplinary consultations that would regard different medical specialties because remember the progress in medicine is very big in different disciplines so in many cases we need to discuss, we need to consult an optimal model approach of treatment. It cannot be the case that we add 
some recommendations of different specialists together we cannot do that like this because then the patient would leave the hospital with a huge number of medications or drugs no it's not the the case so um, because of that, he would have a lot of problems, uh, side effects, right, uh, after these medications. Um, also, of course, other specialists, uh, caregivers, volunteers, and collaboration with family members. That's another point. So family members are crucial to be in contact with if there is no family members. And so uh, collaboration with social care, with social workers to plan the discharge of such patients uh, to provide them with optimal conditions at home so that they have care there, right, once he come back home. Of course, these are costs, right? To hire a lot of people, it's cost-related, right? Uh, it's a huge cost. And these costs also result from the fact that these medical procedures, geriatric procedures, are really expensive and they are not estimated well in hospitals. They are settled uh, by the payer. I believe one procedure, one disease is settled, the one that they are admitted for. But remember, there are some other uh, um, accompanying diseases. We can't treat only this one major one. We have to treat other diseases as well. So we have to change the, uh, the approach. If there are multi-diseases, you know, how can can we approach it? How you know it's, it's expensive, but we have to find costs. We have to find money, resources for that, uh, because they need to be treated also for other diseases, right? And we don't want to have losses here as well, of as well in terms of money as well, in terms of payer. So we need to change that policy. Modern hospitals. Mm. Is it the future? Mm, is it a friendly place for, for elderly patients? Mm, uh, just a few pictures that I would like to show you. Well, this is a modern chance for, for patients. You can have a look how it looks. It's, it looks like a jail a little bit, but in this patient, the patient should be there, lay there, be fully comfortable there. They should treat as a kind of transition point, transition home, let's say. And the worst, uh, if you look at the intensive care units, it's, it's even worse. L look, there's so many procedures, um, pers there's so many personnel, uh, the noise uh, which is there, this light uh, which is there. Well, all this makes the patient feel uncomfortable, you know, in hospital. I'm not saying he becomes ill, but look at that. He can't feel comfortable in such conditions. Um. so like delirium and this is one of the conditions of life threatening also for our elderly patients so changing staff in COVID it was obviously um, even more even strongly uh, hidden I mean hidden behind masks and in special uniforms people uh, resembling some UFO actually for these patients which could not see their families the rooms were closed and the rotation of this staff was high there's a lot of changing persons uh, who provide care. It's not a factor that would optimally impact the patient. Of course, medications, procedures, uh, needles, all these elements which uh, which we expose the patient to for their so-called their good because we have to maintain, we have to diagnose them, to introduce uh, specific therapeutic procedures. So all this should we should try to very carefully think through, analyze and limit to minimum in order to um, for the patient so that this hospital becomes more a friendly place and that they can remain stay in that hospital the shortest possible time so generally we are searching for a solution we should be searching for a solution to create a hospital that is friendly for an elderly patient so limiting all these modern procedures which frequently for this patient will be not understandable not clear and constitute threat, especially for those patients who have got worse cognitive functions, where there is uh, the dementia, the patient does not understand what we want from them. So the changes are really needed, are really needed, and um, of course we can say, as we are here in the room, in every country changes will be expressed in a different degree, because in each country there is a different situation, financial, therefore they may be more or less funds for all these changes that uh, I've been suggesting to you. And there is also a different situation referring to the organization of the healthcare. There's a different situation as for the number of uh, geriatric specialists, the number of geriatric wards, and also post-hospital care, where frequently also 
forms are developed of post-hospital care where the patient has lost just a little physical efficiency, cannot yet come back to their home, but uh, can remain and get better in this intermediate care. Uh, the patient's condition is improved enough that in a month or two months we have we are, have a chance to come back to full physical efficiency from before the disease and the patient may come back to their own house, their own uh, environment and function similarly as they did previously before hospitalization. And uh, as we are sitting here, I would not, I want to wish you a lot of health so that the rarest possible, uh, so that you would attend hospital the rare, rarest possible frequency. Hospital is a very good place, but unfortunately not always friendly to the elderly. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Professor. I have to say that this was not the voice of the panel. It was the, I was, it was a, mm, as well an, an address to all of us, so that this um, consistent program, beautiful program presented by Miss Professor, to carry on further and to lobby where it's possible, in benefit the end of that. And in uh, the room we have persons who have really uh, significant influences. So thank you for presenting these problems, referring to changes and the problem of uh, bad consequences of remaining in a hospital for a long time. And sometimes elderly people dream of going to hospital, right? So uh, thank you very much. I want to kindly ask you now, I want to kindly ask Miss Professor Dr. Professor Bata Tobias Adamczyk from the Jagiellon University, Collegium Medicum also at the University. Professor is a person who not only runs fantastic classes with students, not only analyzes very carefully the problems of elderly age, but late adulthood. But I know Professor, I have known her and I want to thank her. She was known for popularizing this knowledge facilitating the understanding of the problems of elderlyhood in a fantastic there's never old thank you professor thank you very much for inviting us to today's conference and i want to underline that i'm a sociologist of medicine which in the recent years has been dealing with sociology of getting old especially especially I participate in many studies, including also international, referring to the quality of life of people who are old, elderly people. I want to underline here, we have in the room the president of the Polish Gerontological Association. Recently, we did fantastic studies at the level of the state, Paul Senior 2, continuation of the Paul Senior 1. And I also am dealing with uh, perhaps uh, the dark side of elderlyhood, so I am dealing with various forms of violence towards the elderly, and today I would like to draw your attention, above all, focus your attention on matters of um, negligence and self-negligence of people who are old. So if we are thinking about these two forms of violence towards the elderly, well, still, there is a certain lack of awareness that it's a form of bad treatment of people who are elderly. It's a topic which is a taboo topic, frequently not understandable, but frequently very difficult to analyze and to recognize. And if we are thinking about self-negligence, uh, we are thinking of a situation of an elderly person when, uh, due to various uh, reasons, not intentional, but also intentional. Mm, such a person is not able or does not want to um, provide her or himself the basic living conditions. Here I mean of, I mean food, mm, cleanliness, hygiene, a standard of hygienic conditions, both in reference to this person and in reference to the environment in which this person is uh, remains. At the moment, a lot of studies, international studies, present that self-negligence occurs three times more often than the phenomenon of uh, negligence. If we're speaking about negligence, mm, the main offer of this negligence are simply uh, the caregivers. In a situation of Poland, especially 
for above all family caregivers. So it's also very important that this problem is omitted and it has a broader context because mm, people who uh, self-neglect uh, can constitute a um, threat for the surrounding environment. Of course, we realize that self-negligence um, ha is a relative notion. It depends on the cultural context and on the social context frequently, depending on the status, social status, frequently on the social class, these criteria, what self-negligence means, these criteria are differentiated. So therefore, also there is a question how particular uh, communities of elderly people uh, shape given forms, what it means to be a person who is neglected, what does it mean to be a person who is self-neglected, what are the areas of tolerance uh, towards people who are elderly, and this on this depends the definition of neglection and the ne ne neglection itself. I would like to today here show you the results which um, we've been running some studies under the auspices of Rektor Grodzicki, who is a geriatrician who um, has been starting this conference. We have been doing studies in 2017 here in the region of Małopolska in the group uh, which was uh, a poll of uh, about 2,000 inhabitants and I would like to today briefly say, speak about uh, the conditions, demographic social conditions, whether they differentiate the degree of uh, neglection and self-neglection among the elderly. And as for the neglection, well here, uh, contrary to expectations, the greater negligence was noted among women then among men, also above all conditions uh, referring to status, uh, the level of education, these, this phenomenon, this phenomena, in a very, st very strongly conditioned, uh, the highest degree negligence occurred among persons with um, primary or uh, vocational education, and it got lesser and lesser. It reduced along with the higher educational levels. Also, the civil status of those analyzed was significant in terms of whether negligence occurred. Above all, these were people who were widows or divorced, and the least, the lowest percentage of people with negligence occurred among people who remained in marriage. So, and if we're also thinking about the place of inhabitants, yes, also contrary to expectations, negligence was more frequent among inhabitants of cities than among inhabitants of villages, rural areas. This may be connected with this sense of alienation, losing relationships at the level of uh, neighborhood relationships. This may also be the consequence of that. And the second phenomenon, which here I would like to emphasize above all, for years, it was believed that self-negligence is an expression of certain um, disruptions, of some disorders, even connected with the emergence of mental disease. It's not this way. In our case, self-negligence was very high degree noted. Um, we found it among 26.1% of elderly people analyzed. And of course, self-negligence, similarly as negligence, occurred more frequently among people who were in these uh, elderly, most elderly groups, age groups above eight years old compared to younger people, more independent, so 65 to 79 years old. There was It was high among people who were widows or widowers and um, of course this relationship between the level of education and the risk of self-neglection also significantly was significantly marked here. Mm, self-neglection was observed higher among people with mm, primary or vo vocational education, whereas um, we have to say that in contrary to the phenomenon of neglection among people who, basing on interviews, but also to scales which we objectively 
assessed the degree of self-neglection at the, basing on the lo external looks of a given person and also the living conditions in which these people functioned. Well, here the greater degree of self-neglection referred to inhabitants of rural areas than inhabitants of cities. So also the question whether um, lo living alone impacted um, the degree of self-neglection of course, also it had a significant, it was significant, but self-neglection self was also present among elderly people who inhabited uh, bigger households with more people. Here we have the question whether perhaps the remaining members of this household were also people who were self-neglected. And now I would like to show you also um, our results as for self-neglection and uh, living conditions. And here, we have these scales, objective scales, where we have assessed, we were assessing the living conditions in apartments, we assessed, let's say, the external looks, and I would say, just for illustration of these conditions in which elderly people lived, well, please see, this living space is different, it varies, but still these were people who they did not have a bathroom, did not have warm water, who had a toilet outside of the building, who had, who didn't have a kitchen, didn't have a possibility to prepare their uh, warm meal, and there was not a possibility to, there was no washing machine or fridge. So we can say that the self-neglection in a certain small group of people, but still, it was connected with some very low very low, unbelievably low for the 20th century living standard. Mm. To sum up in some way the conditions or the predispositions for self-neglection here, this model shows a multidimensional condition of the phenomenon of neglection. As you can see among demographic conditions, more frequently uh, people who were neglected were women elderly people who have a low level of education, uh, widows or widowers or people who are divorced, but also mm, living in cities. As for the health status, well here also these were people who uh, demonstrated uh, m many dis diseases, comorbidities who had more than three diseases, who had a worse functional status and uh, limiting of cognitive function more frequently they suffered from depression. What was very significant is that these were people who, who whose social network, so social network was uh, very limited. Mm, they had low saturation of the network, they had a low quality of life, and the lifestyle was a, the, a factor which was present was dependence on alcohol, but also the fact that these were at the same time people who were I would say exposed to other forms of violence, especially physical violence, mental violence, and self-neglection. These conditions in a certain degree overlapped, in a certain degree they were, as I have marked earlier, differentiated, so the age also above 80 years old, low self-esteem, and but the place of inhabitants, rural areas, uh, revenue uh, income low, also very low saturation of the social network, which is connected with a lack of support, social support, and this very modest network, this very limited network, led to the fact that the support was small, and the quality of life was higher. As for the health status, similarly, many uh, turned. Um, Multi comorbidities, depression, limiting of cognitive functions. Here we also have um, insufficient nutrition, which was not present in the situation of neglection. But here we have um, um, the element of insufficient nutrition of people with uh, who are elderly. Also, more frequently, um, these people experience problems with required the support of medicines and of course so uh, malnutrition and also abusing alcohol was also an element which was present here so also these people more frequently were victims of thefts and in order to 
continue these studies of ours from the moment of finishing the interviews with these people we continued we continued studies on the um, um, fatality on the death rate of people who uh, were the topics of our subjects of our study we did analysis of uh, the um, mortality of these people before the pandemic in total it was four years of observations in the two first years two first phases of the pandemic i mean 2020 and 2021 uh, then until april so these results there is really a lot I, due, to the, due to the fact that here my speech is supposed to be brief, I wanted to pay attention to the fact that before the pandemic, um, self-neglection, this subjective assessment that you at one is neglected because there were questions, we developed two scales referring to neglection and self-neglection, which have been published uh, in good journals with higher impact factors. So this subjective assessment and self of self-assessment, self-neglection uh, increased twice the risk of death and also these neglections uh, connected with the objective assessment in some way impacted the risk of death and in the second phase of the pandemic where in our case the, these deaths were nearly as highest also uh, these two dimensions of self-neglection so uh, both the subjective dimension in the opinion of the senior him or herself and also the objective impression here increased the risk of death therefore i would like to say that well we have certain calls there are certain calls that of course this person this elderly person is in, is in the weak environment weak social network, weak social support this may result in the fact that there is no social reaction to self-neglection but on the other hand, well, in some way, there is, it's very significant that these two factors, and especially the factor of self-neglection, impacted the risk of death both before the pandemic and in progress of the pandemic. And of course, of course, this area, this living area, in some way could impact self-negligence in some way. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Ms. Professor, and uh, another challenge for us, especially for these two determinants from uh, several mentioned by Professor, such as um, loose social bonds or, um, I would say, or the lifestyle. This all can be impacted by us all gathered here. We have to focus on that. Thank you very much for this speech. Now I want to give the floor to and we will shall listen about the presentation of the problems from the perspective of Mr. Janusz Marszałek, the president of the board of the Polish Union of Seniors and a member of the European Union of Seniors. I want to remind you that we have uh, we have just a few minutes. Yeah, briefly, ladies and gentlemen, we have just a few minutes until the coffee break. So I will very briefly present what I have to say or just signal. Well, I am for over 40 years. I have been a volunteer as for actions for the benefit of orphans. Some of you know my uh, youth village, children village, which has been functioning for 28 years now. Before it uh, was created, it was uh, as a volunteer, uh, people were surprised that as a private citizen uh, person, I got engaged in operations for or orphans. But um, since 1994, uh, I have been, my children village has been functioning center for um, people children who are orphans in Rajskon or Oświęcim. So over 60 children now have gained independence. So really good practice. And please imagine that with this activity, um, also defending in some situation, defending the functioning of existence of this uh, children's village. There was a situation when this was needed. The uh, society uh, selected me to be the elected me to be the president of the city of Oświęcim, 2002 to 2011. And during that service, I had the opportunity to see what it looks like from the point of view of local governments, 
uh, care also provided to the seniors, to the elderly, how this is organized through the municipal center for social aid, but also in collaboration through the Association of Town Cities of Poland. I had an opportunity to see how it functions in Poland, but also later on as the um, boss of the Commission for the Collaboration of Partnering Countries in whole Europe, I noticed, I saw how it functions in remaining countries of the EU. And out of this, this was the origin of very interesting concepts as for the housing industry for seniors housing. And what Mr. Professor Biglewska mentioned, if earlier we could monitor certain, um, let's say, uh, behaviors or how to differently organize support for seniors, if um, if we found, I would say, a model very interesting in the Netherlands and Rotterdam, where which very interestingly um, has been elaborated, perfected by for dozens of years, and it shows actually how housings which yeah, houses which young people buy they have in neighboring estates. It's a system for cities, how you can organize this housing, uh, rent housing, rent housing with support so that uh, the services from uh, municipal social aid centers could quickly react and support, monitor on a current basis. Uh, hello, sir, hello, madam, how are you feeling? Is everything okay? I see, you know, a brief signal. You can see a brief signal. You don't have to go far and find this person. You can organize it as frequently we have in Poland, uh, like um, day care houses where they uh, children, they people participate, have a possibility for rehabilitation, for contacting the doctors, and also the caregivers who uh, help everyone that needs help. Or if there's a situation in a um, apartment that they need support, just a um, phone call or just a ring, and you can react really quickly to support a person in such a situation. In the West, very frequently these uh, apartments with support are a function, and in Poland it's still just starting. I think not only in Poland, but in the countries of the former uh, Soviet bloc, also in Estonia, also in Lithuania, Luf Latvia, the Republic of Czech Republic, Slovakia, Hungary, all these countries, we've got the same similar uh, problems. And I think that, by the way, sometime in the future, we could uh, see uh, this program, how it, we have elaborated, how it functions. I have just signalized this problem. And how much time have I got left? Two minutes still. Three minutes. OK, so I wanted to signal also the problem which um, in COVID was not noticed, but after all, in televisions, Polish, European, every once in a while we speak about uh, tick, ticks and uh, tick-related uh, diseases. Tick-related diseases. So, it, according to expectations, it's a very serious social problem in particular countries, which medicines do not, uh, physicians do not notice yet because they this disease. Uh, uh, is related in um, joints, or there are bone uh, diseases, or uh, also uh, Lyme disease affects uh, nerve endings, and there is uh, some, there is a similar condition as in sclerosis multiplex, or there is the inflammation of the brain, where special physicians specialize, but frequently they are not aware that this may be connected with uh, ticks. And with Ms. van der Leyen, collaboration with uh, Dr. Worms, which was the president of the European Union of Seniors, in collaboration with several persons who really are experts in pharmacy and politics, uh, we have addressed Ms. von der Leyen to have a proposal to organize, in particular countries of the EU, organize, organized actions for eliminating ticks. And mosquitoes and with the help of volunteering fire brigades and also in collaboration of scientists from biologists and also bee breeders so as not to disrupt the system in ecological system um, in order to be able to protect people from this disease um, in Poland every year minimum 20,000 new cases of Lyme disease is diagnosed but we don't say it's just a just, an, just a part of what is being, you know, 
and the disease is maybe really problematic, eliminate people from work for many years. Therefore, this problem we also have to focus on. That's just uh, as signalizing. We are on time. Ms. Doctor, Ms. President, I give you back the floor. Thank you very much uh, to the participants of our panel. Thank you very much for such um, attentive listening. I give this floor now to the next uh, panelists. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Ladies and gentlemen, I believe this was a very interesting uh, topic referring to the problems of uh, healthcare, of course, selected healthcare problems and social care. I want to thank you very much uh, to our dear panelists for the time devoted that they prepared materials and for fantastic, fantastic message that we could understand what problems you wanted to inform us about and what to draw our attention to because we, coming back to our communities to collaborate with seniors, will for sure use that. I also want to convey to you an organizational message, information message, that all the email addresses we can uh, send to you these materials which today have been presented as presentations. We shall also publish them on the websites and uh, the Federation of the Third Age Universities and also other institutions, Poland, Polish Senior Union, European Senior Union, so that you have access to the whole and the possibility to uh, translate this into the language which is necessary for you. Also, I have to say that the conference is being recorded and uh, for four languages. And all the conference, the recordings, shall be also available to you and we will be able to, in your countries, in your communities, use this material at the same time it's fantastic material, even as documentation, right? To which you can refer, you can uh, play, you can repeat, use some fragments. We try to also have such a perspective on the possibility to remain easy access to this documentation, which may be useful after the conference. And just uh, some practical information. Mm, now, in the time of the break, the catering shall be available. The, um, floor above, you should use the stairs, and there's also an elevator on the corridor, so you can use also the elevator. Mm, I got a hint here from my colleagues, and also one more comment, that in the hall, thanks to the Ms. Anna Okońska-Walkowicz and President uh, of the City of Krakow, Yes, Majkowski, and thanks to the Marshal's office, we have obtained folders, promotional folders for the city of Krakow and Małopolska, and they are in several linguistic versions. They are available at the second table next to the reception table, so please also kindly use that. I think in, we have it in German, English, Spanish, and uh, about Małopolska, about Krakow, you can have a read and find out more. So thank you, please be invited now to the break, to the coffee break, and we come back here at 11, quarter to 12, quarter to 12, we come back here, that's in the program. So have a nice coffee break and see you here quarter to 12. Thank you very much. Dobrze, że bardzo. Dobrze, że tyle lat pracy.